Good morning. Today's date is April 9, 2007. My name is Richard Nicholas. Today I will be conducting an oral history interview with George Cardison for the Veterans History Project in partnership with the Dalton Council on Aging. This interview is being held at the Dalton Community Television Studio in Dalton, Massachusetts. Good morning, George. Good morning. Uh, would you state your, your full name, please, and would you spell your last name? I'd be glad to. George Cardison, Jr. I'll spell the last name, K-A-R-D-A-S-E-N. And where do you presently live, George? I live here in Dalton, Massachusetts. Could you tell us your date of birth and where you were born? Yes, I was born on July 9, 1921, in Passaic, New Jersey. Uh, did you grow up and go to school there? No. Uh, I was uh, raised primarily in Clifton, New Jersey, which is adjacent to Passaic. And you went to school in Clifton? I went to school in Clifton, graduated high school. Did you uh, have any brothers and sisters? I had one sister uh, who was about uh, three years younger than I am. Mm -hmm. And what did your dad do for a living? My dad uh, works as an upholster, and uh, my mother uh, was working in the world of mills. During this period of time, both parents had to work. This was during the Depression? It, it was during the Depression, yes. Uh, was your dad a veteran? Yes, my dad was a veteran of uh, World War I. Did he serve overseas? He uh, served uh, overseas with the uh, uh, First Division. And uh, he uh, got wounded at the Battle of uh, St. Uh, Michael. And uh, in the course of his actions, he also earned the uh, Silver Star. And could you tell us a little bit about when he was wounded? Uh, yes, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, they, they had started their offensive at this uh, great battle, and he was uh, leading his squad, and uh, a shell exploded. Uh, it killed the last uh, four men in the squad, and the first three were wounded. And uh, he said that he laid down on the battlefield uh, all, all morning, watched the American troops go forward, and then they retreated. Uh, the enemy, the German troops, uh, passed him by, and he said he watched the whole battle going on. And uh, then the uh, Americans moved forward, and it was about that time that uh, he got uh, treated and was sent to an aid station. His wound was primarily in his leg. Very interesting. Uh, did you graduate from high school, George? Yes, I did uh, graduate from Clifton High School in uh, 1939. Mm -hmm. And, and what did you do after you graduated? And after I graduated, uh, I had a big decision whether to go to college or not, but I decided I would uh, go to work, and I uh, got a job as uh, office boy in the Botany Worcester Mill. Uh, your father wanted you to go to school, didn't he? <laughs> he, he did. Uh, he, as he told me, that he had the only opportunity to get only to the fourth grade, and he wanted me to uh, uh, go to college, but uh, being the young age of uh, 17 at the time, I uh, started to say that I can do anything I want, which I is later in life I found out that that's not true. But um, it was a long time before I decided I would go to college. And uh, how, how did that come about? Did you, did you start writing? I worked for the... Uh, uh, Botany Worcester Mill for uh, uh, a little under a year and uh, the great moment came when I was called in and I got an increase in pay of three cents an hour and after doing a little mathematics I found out that on a dollar twenty a week <laughs> you're not going to get uh, too far ahead and that was when I uh, made the decision that I uh, would apply to uh, 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 to different universities so I can go to uh, go to college, uh, which I did, and uh, I uh, wrote to a number of school schools, and it uh, I got uh, accepted to quite a few. But the first one that came was from the University of Alabama, and uh, within a few days after I uh, received the uh, acceptance notice, I was on my way, and off I went. Mm -hmm. 
And what was your major at the university? Uh, when I got to the university, I was majoring in uh, electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. Now, while you were there, were you also enrolled in ROTC? Uh, yes, it was a requirement uh, for the first two years for all uh, uh, male students to uh, take uh, ROTC, which I did. And I did complete uh, two years uh, while I was at uh, college, mm -hmm. ba basic ROTC. I uh, applied for the advanced, which was for juniors and seniors, but I wasn't accepted because of uh, health reasons, which were my uh, eyes were bad, period. Mm -hmm. And about this time, did you also receive notice from your draft board back in New Jersey? Well, what happened was that on December 7th, 1941, uh, while I was at school is when uh, uh, Pearl Harbor incident occurred and, uh, uh, in, in uh, 1942, er, early, uh, I was uh, given a six-month uh, deferment, which uh, meant that uh, I would be called up uh, in the latter part of uh, 42. Mm -hmm. Now, at the university, at ROTC headquarters, uh, did you find out about a special training group that would, might be, well, you might be interested in? Yeah, well, it, what was happening <coughs> during, that, excuse me, during that period of time, uh, many of the college students were enlisting in the uh, uh, Army Reserve or Naval Reserve unassigned, which meant that uh, when they got called in, they could be assigned to wherever uh, the government needed them. Uh, I noticed that there was one particular uh, notice for uh, uh, students that were in their junior or senior year in what they call the electronic training group. And one of the qualifications, well, two of them, major qualifications were that they should be majoring in electrical engineering, and uh, secondly, they should have some uh, uh, sort of uh, radio uh, license. And during that period of time, I had a uh, uh, amateur uh, radio license. Did you, so you I got applied. that back in high school, did you? I got my amateur radio license back in high school, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I filled out the application that was sent in. And within uh, a week, uh, I got called to the ROTC headquarters and said I was accepted and uh, told to put up my right hand. and. The colonel in charge uh, uh, gave the oath and shook my hand, and he says, you are now a member of the U.S. Army Reserve, period. And this was in October of 1942? That is correct. Uh, had colleges, because of the war, accelerated their, their programs at this time? Yes, especially the program that I was in, uh, uh, engineering, uh, starting in... Uh, January of uh, 1943, uh, they uh, uh, accelerated a program such that a uh, six-month uh, course was uh, three months. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I was put on that uh, program, and uh, I uh, did complete my uh, junior and senior year in a year and a little, about a year and a half less. Now, you mentioned this time off camera to me, uh, the ASTP program, could you tell me what that is? Well, what happened was that uh, uh, the Army uh, and the Air Force were uh, wanted uh, uh, trained uh, uh, college uh, people. And so uh, uh, during this period of time, uh, over the various uh, universities around the country, they sent a detachment of uh, uh, troops, which were all Air Force men, for uh, studies in uh, engineering. And at the uh, university, uh, we had a contingency of uh, Air Force men that were uh, studying uh, engineering. And uh, while they were there, and of course uh, I was uh, well uh, acquainted with the uh, studies at the university, I got the job of uh, lab instructor, and so uh, while the uh, troops were there, uh, I was running the uh, electrical lab. The ASTP was the Army Specialized Training uh, Program, and it lasted uh, until the uh, 
uh, was the uh, beginning of uh, 1944 is when they, uh, the early part of the 1944 is when they uh, uh, stopped the program and all of the uh, uh, troops were called back to active service, if you will. Mm -hmm. Now, did you graduate from the University of Alabama during this time period? Yes, it was about, uh, uh, actually the time frame was about a month after the ASTP program closed down, which was in the February. Uh, I graduated in March of uh, 1944 and I was called up to active duty and uh, Did you, I, uh, excuse me, the interrupting, uh, did you earn a degree at? I got my degree in uh, March of 1944. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you were called up for active duty? I was called for active duty and reported to uh, uh, Fort McPherson in uh, Atlanta, mm -hmm. Georgia. Did you receive any training at McPherson? No, none at all. It was just a uh, uh, I guess you'd call it a, a, a army post that uh, uh, was uh, in, uh, uh, putting <laughs> servicemen into the introduction into the service. In other words, the physical find out where they would uh, get their basic training and uh, just what they would qualify for in, in the duty with the service. Okay, and uh, where were you finally sent for your basic training? Well, I was uh, since I was with this electronic training group, which is attached to the Signal Corps, uh, I was sent to uh, Camp Crowder, Missouri, uh, for uh, basic uh, training. I was there for uh, uh, 13 weeks of uh, basic training. Mm -hmm. And was this training slanted toward a, a certain subject, like sig the Signal Corps more than...? Yes, it was, and it was... Uh, it was interesting because of the fact that uh, I did meet uh, some of the uh, uh, fellows that uh, I was uh, that were in my class uh, uh, when I went to the university, mm -hmm. and they got assigned to uh, uh, the Signal Corps, even though they were Air Force uh, personnel. Uh, they got transferred to the Signal Corps, and they got the, also their training. And you still received regular Army training here too. Oh, that? definitely, yes. Now, was it hard for you to adjust to this new life in the military? No, because of the fact that uh, I learned that uh, one lives through the different phases of life. Uh, by that, uh, when I went to school, high school, I had uh, the uh, friends that I had made, but uh, upon completion of high school, why each and every one of us went our own path. So, in essence, uh, uh, I never did see any of the, uh, after that period of time, any of my friends that I graduated high school from. Uh, and uh, when I went to uh, work at uh, uh, Botany, I met, met people. But again, it was just a phase of life. When I went into the service, rather back to when I went to the college first, I met different people as friends. But when you finish, you're on your own. You just can't look back because it's something to look back at and say, yes, that's, uh, I enjoyed what I did, but now I have to look forward to what's going to happen next. Interesting. Uh, while at BASIC, uh, you mentioned an unusual incident that happened. <laughs> well, there were a lot of uh, unusual incidents, but this was one in particular. Uh, what happened was that when I got to uh, Fort McPherson, I had uh, notified my folks that I was at Fort McPherson and made the mistake of giving them an address. Well, they in turn uh, told, told the neighbor that uh, I was assigned there and uh, he happened to be in the uh, uh, fruit and vegetable business. And so very, they were very kind. They uh, gave my folks uh, uh, a whole package of uh, fresh <laughs> fruit and vegetable. I said, send it to George at where he is. So the folks took it and uh, they put some clothes in, some socks and whatnot, and they sent it to Fort McPherson. And meanwhile, I had shipped over to Camp Crowder. And uh, well, I, after it was a few weeks there, I got notified that uh, I was to report to the orderly room. It was very important. I really didn't know what it was, but when I went there, the fellow was there in a jeep, and he says, get in the jeep, 
He said, I'm going to take you over to a place there. He says, you're the one we've been trying to locate. Not knowing what it was, but uh, on one part of the camp, they took me, they took me into this building, and a fellow stood by the doorway, and he says, in the corner, there's a package that's yours. Take it, and I don't care what you do with it. <laughs> well, it turned out that uh, it was all fresh fruit and vegetables, which have been decaying for the past month, if you will, <laughs> and the odor was uh, terrible. And I opened up the package, uh, whatever socks my folks had included, why I took it and gently wrapped it all up and deposited it gently but firmly in a garbage can. <laughs> <laughs> and he laughed about it. He said that this was terrible. He says we use this barracks for packages like this. <laughs> Great story. And uh, you said that basic was 13 weeks? Basic was uh, 13 weeks. And upon completion, I went to uh, Fort Monmouth, uh, which was the uh, uh, basic uh, uh, Army uh, Signal Corps uh, mm -hmm. Uh, station, if you will. And what, what type of training do you receive here, George? Well, there I uh, uh, took uh, two uh, primary courses. The first one was 12 weeks in uh, uh, radio uh, uh, operation and uh, maintenance of uh, most of the uh, major uh, uh, operating equipment that the Army used, receivers, transmitters, and whatnot. And upon completion there, we then went to uh, a radar school, and uh, uh, there we uh, worked primarily with uh, a radar called SCR uh, 584, which was uh, one that was uh, uh, in a uh, trailer, and uh, primarily for uh, uh, controlling uh, anti-aircraft uh, uh, guns. It was used primarily in England during the uh, Battle of Britain. Uh, this, I found out, uh, uh, is what the ETG uh, group really stood for, was the uh, training of radar. And uh, it took that long before I really found out what the primary uh, purpose of the electronic training group. Well, radar was relatively uh, secretive at that time, oh, wasn't it? Oh, it was. Uh, in fact, I talked to uh, some of the uh, fellows that uh, were called in earlier in the electronic training group. And uh, the word radar, uh, during the period of 1942-43, uh, was uh, a sacred word. You could cut court-martial for just even mentioning it. Mm -hmm. So it was really highly secretive. Now, also at this time, uh, didn't you learn that you were not going to be receive a commission? Well, what happened was that uh, it was in the late uh, uh, 40... Uh, uh, 44, uh, that uh, the uh, program was uh, phased out, and uh, I was with the last group. Uh, there was uh, uh, something like around 22 or 23 of us, uh, uh, all college graduates from different universities around the country that uh, were in the same position that I was. We were all uh, assigned to the electronic training group. But uh, they got to the point where they were no longer uh, uh, continuing with the program. Uh, initially, what the program consisted of was uh, sending uh, uh, the engineers to MIT for uh, uh, training. And uh, quite a few of them did go over to England at that period of time. But uh, this was during a period of time when the uh, war in uh, Europe was uh, uh, coming to a uh, conclusion. Mm -hmm. So they, they told us at the time that uh, they, uh, they were not, uh, re there was no need for, uh, for us uh, being there, but they were going to see if they could, uh, uh, t they said that out of the 23 of us, they only needed two <laughs> <laughs> officers. <laughs> so it just matter who they were going to take. Uh, I was not one of them. So uh, they, they gave us the rank of uh, corporal, and uh, they uh, then assigned uh, the rest of us to get uh, uh, specialized training in uh, naval radar. Okay, and at this time you did get another assignment? That's right. This is when we got sent to uh, uh, San Diego to get 
uh, work with the Navy uh, uh, Training uh, Center. And uh, while we were there, we were assigned to Fort Rosecrans. And can you describe Fort Rosecrans Yeah, Fort for Ro us? It's interesting because uh, in order to get to Fort Rosecrans, it was out on the uh, peninsula. You had to go through the uh, Marine base, and you had to go through the Navy base, and there you were on the very tip, Fort Rosecrans, and it was an old, old uh, uh, field artillery uh, uh, base, uh, which uh, during the early part of the war was very, very active. They had all the large uh, coastal guns there and all. And uh, it was interesting because they were all hidden and you wouldn't uh, find out unless you really started to tour the uh, peninsula and pay close attention before you found out where they were really located. Uh, I went through the uh, old army cemetery that was there and it was all uh, 1850 and uh, 1880s, really. Uh, and so that's where we stayed there. Uh, the, the uh, as they call it, the 23 of us, this is where we were. Uh, but uh, daily we would uh, report to the uh, Navy Training Center where uh, we would get uh, training in the operation of uh, SO radar. We were there for a little over three weeks. Mm -hmm. And and after uh, Fort Rosecrans, <coughs> where were you assigned? Well, after we completed the uh, program, we were sent back to uh, Fort Monmouth, and there we were told that uh, uh, we were going to uh, Seagirt, uh, in New Jersey. Uh, Seagirt uh, was one of the offshoots of the Army base of Fort Monmouth, and uh, there was some uh, barracks and uh, uh, facilities there. And it's about, uh, I don't know, about 30, 40 miles south of uh, Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. And uh, there uh, we set up uh, uh, training uh, radar school for uh, incoming personnel. We come to find out that uh, the uh, course would last uh, us uh, three weeks or in that order. And there were 1,500 uh, that were assigned uh, for it. So the 23 of us were uh, assigned as the instructors who taught the course and the maintenance of uh, SO radar. And within that period of time, we did train 1,500 uh, uh, men in the operation. Now, the men that finished would then be assigned to uh, a different uh, uh, coastal bases uh, overseas or in the States for assignment to Army transport ships. Now, after the, this school closed at, at some point? That's right. The school did uh, close, and we all went back to Monmouth, where we uh, got assigned to uh, different bases. I was assigned to the uh, uh, Brooklyn Army Base. In Brooklyn, New York? That's right. And uh, what, what was your assignment there, George? Well, when we first got there, we didn't know just what was going to happen. And uh, after a few days uh, being there, we got uh, notified of the uh, different ships that uh, we were assigned to, and uh, we had a crew of three men which was uh, being assigned to each uh, Army transport. There was the uh, chief uh, uh, radar maintenance man and uh, two uh, operators. I was the chief uh, radio uh, op radar man for my crew, mm -hmm. and we got assigned to uh, the Jared M. Huddleston, which was an old uh, Liberty ship, which was uh, converted to a hospital ship and uh, operating out of the Brooklyn Army base. Now, these were run by the Army, but were they Army? Oh, this, this, these were run by the Army, but they had uh, civilian uh, uh, personnel and a civilian uh, captain mm -hmm. uh, in charge of it. and. Uh, Army uh, uh, personnel that were just assigned for whatever duty they were assigned to. For instance, uh, during when it was a hospital ship, all medical personnel was Army on that. But they were civilian-owned? The civilians just operated the ship. That's mm -hmm. all they did. I see. 
<clears throat> and your duties on board ship were what, George? Well, when we got assigned to the uh, ship, uh, uh, we, we had, had uh, SO radar installed, and uh, we had to uh, uh, maintain that uh, while we were in operation, mm -hmm. you know, when the ship was in transit. Now you say SO radar. What, what is that? Well, that was a uh, uh, naval uh, uh, assignment to the uh, 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 to the radar equipment. Now, what the SO stood for, I don't know. Oh, I, see. I can tell you what the, the Army had was what they would say SCR, which was a Signal Corps radio or a Signal Corps radar. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Navy weren't we were not familiar with it. All we knew was that it was. Uh, a series of uh, SO, which was one of the uh, uh, Navy uh, operating uh, systems. I see. Now, did you find out at this time what the mission of the ship was going to be? No. We, when we got assigned to, we had no idea what was, what, what was going to happen. All we were told was uh, to uh, report to a certain dock, uh, and, which we did, and we uh, got our assignment aboard the ship. Uh, our, our, uh, our crew was uh, assigned to the uh, uh, radio shack, which was the uppermost uh, part of the ship. Uh, there was Army personnel, but we have no, no uh, uh, association with them at all. We were just three isolated people uh, all by ourselves. And uh, then we found out uh, really what was going on. They were getting prepared to uh, return uh, uh, German prisoners of war uh, back to Germany. These uh, had been held in the United States? These were held in the United States, that's right. But uh, the ones that we were taking back were uh, uh, Ger German prisoners that were in real bad shape uh, health-wise. Uh, there was quite a number of amputees. They were, uh, ones with pneumonia, and, uh, and as we were in, in conversation with uh, uh, some of the uh, Army personnel, we were told that uh, um, they felt that on the average, uh, after they were released from U.S. service, uh, or they would have on the average of perhaps six months or more to live. Mm. And they were, uh, as we were told, he says, they're just bringing them home to die, period. Right. And there was a large number of them, weren't we had We took something like, uh, it was over, a little over 1,200 or so that were being uh, taken aboard the ship. And when, they, you were going to France, is that correct? When did That's you right. leave, do you know? Uh, we left around Thanksgiving uh, Day, November that, of that year of, uh, uh, that was uh, 40, 45, I guess it was. And uh, <laughs> we left around Thanksgiving Day, and off we went. Uh, the Liberty ship that we were on uh, was not one that uh, one would take uh, as being a speedster, if you will. Yeah. The, <laughs> the fastest that it could go under uh, excellent conditions was about 12 knots. And we were lucky if we averaged uh, nine knots. So it was uh, quite a... Uh, uh, quite a journey, especially at that time of the year when the North Atlantic was pretty rough. And so it took us over 30 days to go from uh, uh, Brooklyn Army Base to uh, Cherbourg, uh, France. And the weather was, was bad. Oh, did it, was did it affect bad. you? <laughs> it affected me in, this, in that uh, uh, when we hit those North Atlantic storms, uh, that's the first time in my life that I, I was really, uh, really scared, and I mean scared. Uh, the ship would, uh, and I'm sure that some of the other veterans probably <laughs> experienced the same, same thing, but uh, my assignment was on the bridge uh, operating the radar. Why we operated the radar during the Atlantic storm, I'll never know, but we had to operate it. And uh, the interesting thing was that the ship would suddenly rise up and you couldn't see the water at all, it was just the w water just splashing, and then it would come down with a slam, and all you had to was water just splashing up on the, <laughs> the on torches. And uh, 
I always figured that one of these times it was when it went down, it was going to go straight down. <laughs> <coughs> but it yeah. never did. But I was scared. I was really, really scared. I didn't know I imagine. whether they'd ever make it or not. In fact, uh, they used to keep a daily record of uh, how many miles we covered a, a day. <coughs> Excuse me. And when we hit the um, Atlantic storms, why at times we had uh, negative uh, uh, mileage, if you will. Yes, but on, on the average, we used to we used to average around 200 uh, uh, miles a day. So it was a long, long trip. Believe me. I imagine. Now, off camera, you told me that the captain of the ship, he was a civilian, uh, was very strict. Oh, he can was very... Give, can you give some examples? Oh, yes, he was very, very strict. In fact, uh, I don't uh, remember hearing him ever talk to anyone while he was on a bridge except to issue orders, and that was it. Well, the uh, first day after we left Brooklyn Army Base, uh, they had a uh, fire drill and uh, all the prisoners were brought out on deck with their guards and told to line up. And uh, what happened was that uh, uh, one of the prisoners was smoking. And uh, they yelled over the speaker for him to put out a cigarette. And uh, he was, uh, I don't know, a little arrogant, if you will, because after he was told to put the cigarette out, he took the cigarette and put it his, in his mouth and took a last puff, then looked up and dropped it and then put the cigarette out. And the captain looked at it and he just said, uh, throw that man in a brig, period. And so they took him away and they, as I understand it, they just put him in the brig and he was there for the rest of the trip. And you mentioned another example. Uh were some of, some of the prisoners that complained about the food? Oh, yeah. that was another incident. What they did, the prisoners were fed uh, two meals a day. And uh, from what I understand, they were, they were fed uh, stew. And so they were to have stew in the morning and stew in the evening. And uh, uh, apparently they complained because they wanted some variety of food instead of the same thing every day. And so there was a committee of five that were assigned, and I remember I was up on the bridge at the time, and uh, these fellas came up, and uh, they were talking. The captain looked at them very much, listened very quietly. <clears throat> they uttered their complaints, and uh, incidentally, while I was there, the troop commander was all, the army troop commander was there listening too. And when they had finished their complaints, the captain uh, agreed that that was, he, he agreed with what they were saying, and uh, he said because of that, he told, took the five of them, told them, put these gentlemen in the brig, and uh, they'll be there for a few days, and they'll be given bread and water, and see if that will change your diet any. <laughs> and after that, there were no complaints. No, I wouldn't think so. <laughs> no, there were no complaints at all about the meal or anything. Everybody was happy. Now, you mentioned also, George, a boat drill. Where you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was interesting too because uh, uh, they had a uh, boat drill, and uh, my assignment was to go to the bridge. The two uh, uh, fellows that were uh, in the crew, they were uh, given assignment uh, to report to certain uh, boat. These are lifeboats, right? Lifeboats, right? And so here I am up on the on the bridge, and we went through the whole. Uh, uh, boat drill, everybody got their assignment, and after it was over, dismissed, and I asked the stupid question of, uh, where do I go from here? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, you look, he says, well, you go down with the captain. Uh, I didn't quite believe that, but to this day, I still don't know what right. I was assigned to. <laughs> well, let's hope, let's, it's a good thing you never had to find out, right? Yeah, that's for sure. Now, how long did it take you to get to Cherbourg? Uh, it was over 30 days, because mm -hmm. uh, we left at Thanksgiving, and uh, we got to Cherbourg. It was, uh, I think it was about two days before Christmas, mm -hmm. in that period of time. And what was the weather like and when you when arrived? And when we got there, it, it was raining, cold, and uh, they uh, took, all the prisoners were unloaded, and I remember we were up, of course, looking to see what they were doing. And uh, uh, 
we watched them and uh, really felt sorry for them because they lined them all up on the dock, pouring rain, and they had to stand there, uh, wait, and uh, a little, little while later, why well, army trucks started to come in and they started to load them up on army army trucks. And where they took them from there, I have no idea because they uh, uh, just emptied the dock, if you will, and all 1,200 of them disappeared. Mm -hmm. And we were there in Sherberg for uh, a little over a week. Uh, the ship itself, uh, during that period of time, we got assigned to a dock. We unloaded, and from that point on, we were out into the bay, anchored, and stayed there. And what we were doing, found out that we were waiting while they uh, picked up uh, any uh, uh, wounded or accident cases around uh, France and Germany to uh, go back to the States. I see. Now, did you have some free time? We had some free time, so uh, uh, we uh, uh, finally found who the troop, our troop commander was and uh, I told him who we were. <laughs> he didn't even know who we were, but we told well, we were the radar crew and uh, asked him to get a leave. So uh, we got leave and uh, uh, we uh, decided we were going to go to Paris. We hitched a ride with uh, uh, an ambulance that was uh, uh, going there. So the fellow says, well, jump in. And uh, he drove us there. So the three of us uh, went to Paris. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned an interesting stop that you made on the yeah, way. Yeah, we did. Uh, uh, we stopped at uh, the cemetery. In fact, I think I showed you a picture that was yes. taken of the uh, uh, ones that uh, didn't make it on D-Day, and it was the uh, Army Cemetery. It, it was quite it was quite dramatic to, to see that because we did stop and uh, walk through the part of it, and I'll never forget that. But it was it was a sight to see. There's there was a lot of crosses, believe me. Mm -hmm. And this was just outside of Cherbourg? Yes. Now, eventually you returned to Cherbourg. How did you get back? Uh, <laughs> uh, after we spent uh, a few days in uh, Paris, uh, we uh, went to the railroad station. We found that, I don't know. And uh, we were trying to uh, find out how to get a ticket to go to Cherbourg. Uh, well, we were fortunate in that uh, uh, there was a gentleman that came over and uh, spoke uh, French, and so he asked us in English, of course, where, what our problem was, and we told him, and he took us over to the ticket agent who's got our tickets for us, so we were able to get back to Sherberg in time to uh, uh, make the return trip home. Uh, now, after you reboarded your ship, can you tell us about the the, the harbor at Cherbourg, what was going on there? Oh, yes. It was, well, during that period of time, again, you had to wait for a uh, assignment to, to uh, dock uh, the ship and take care of your whatever you had to do. Uh, it was during this period of time that there were uh, uh, troops were coming home and troops were landing for the Army of Occupation. And uh, I remember looking up at the hillside and you see these army trucks continually going up and down, going up loaded with uh, troops for the um, uh, Army of Occupation and uh, troops that were uh, coming back. Uh, we took uh, quite a number of uh, of the troops aboard our ship and I, I remember uh, they were talking, they wanted to get some uh, medical uh, experts that they needed. They said they needed two because of uh, some of the casualties that they had aboard. And uh, they said, uh, oh yes, we have two. I don't know who they were contacting, but apparently it was somebody in the harbor. But he said, but in order for you to get the two, we have to take eight more, take these 10 people. And uh, what uh, <laughs> the story we heard was, there was quite an argument about it, but it ended up that we took uh, the 10 that we wanted to get back to the States. And uh, so uh, they took that. And uh, we spent the time finish loading up, and from Cherbourg, instead of heading right back, uh, uh, we went over to Southampton, England. 
And there at Southampton, uh, they had uh, uh, some uh, wax and uh, uh, army nurses that had uh, fulfilled their uh, duties and they were on their way back. Mm -hmm. And so they, they took them, loaded them aboard the ship too, and then we started uh, back. One of the interesting things, I didn't mention to you this earlier, is the fact that during this whole period of time, we never took any supplies aboard the ship. We had our own water supply, which we had when we left Brooklyn, and we had the, the food supply. And uh, after we left Southampton, they started to ration water because it was getting at, at the critical point. Everybody wanted to take a shower, and uh, so they limited uh, really the use of water at that period of time. And the food wasn't that great on the way back as it was? Well, uh, it's interesting because when we were going over, uh, instead of eating with the uh, uh, army uh, personnel that were the guards for the prisoners, uh, somehow or other we got tied up uh, with this separate dining room, how we got there, I, I don't recall, but uh, we got to know the uh, uh, chefs that were aboard the ship. And so they told us, uh, uh, you're not going to be friends with friends with them also. They said, well, you fellas want to eat, there's just the three of you. He says, come on down and we'll feed you here. And so I never ate with the uh, regular army personnel. We used to go to this dining room. I, to this day, I don't know where it was located. We knew how to get there and we would get our meals. And uh, coming back, when we were heading back to the, to, uh, the States again, why uh, uh, they started changing things around, but uh, we still went to this same little dining room. So uh, we did get some pretty good meals, but uh, some of the uh, Army personnel that we later found out they said that uh, they put them on a stew diet. <laughs> they were getting <laughs> stew twice a day. <laughs> but uh, well, we, we would go down the, uh, these cooks would uh, uh, give us some of the special things that, uh, that were being fed to other, other uh, personnel. Well, good for you. <laughs> now, also you mentioned uh, you got an SOS call from another ship on the way, over, on the way home. Well, I, that's another interesting story. As I told, told you earlier, our quarters were uh, right next to the radio room. And uh, uh, I can copy code. And the problem that I had was that uh, I'd be sleeping there and not hear this code chattering all the time from the radio room. But the interesting thing was that the uh, number of SOSs that were coming through, uh, it's not because the ship was uh, in trouble, if you will, but uh, somebody fell overboard, and uh, they would give the location of the point, and they say, anybody in the vicinity, look, look for them. But the ship would go on. It very rarely would they stop. If somebody fell overboard, uh, it was too bad. Yeah. But you, you said there was a ship that had a rudder problem? Well, coming back now, uh, we were out of uh, New York, uh, was a couple, oh, I'd say about maybe two or three days, and uh, picked up an SOS from a ship that was having uh, trouble with its radar, uh, rather its rudder. And uh, uh, the battle cry came, the Huddleston to the rescue. Uh, you have to understand now, the Huddleston was not a very fast-going ship. As I said, we, sometimes we would get up to 12 knots, but the average was 9 to 10 not, and uh, uh, there were some ships that were going to uh, Europe that came within vicinity of this ship that was in trouble, and uh, our captain had them radio back to say that uh, we're going, so continue on your way, we'll, we'll, we'll help them. And I was on, on duty on radar, and I picked them up at about 12 miles, so we found the ship. And uh, we said, we'd, you know, be there to help you. When the radio message came back saying that they had fixed their radar, or rather their rudder, and uh, were uh, on their way to New York. So uh, wired back saying that uh, we'll follow. 
Well, with our speed, <laughs> they had arrived in New York, and we were still a day and a half behind them. <laughs> then we got off the coast, uh, off the uh, Long Island uh, coast, and we could have pulled into uh, uh, New York Harbor uh, about four or five o'clock in the afternoon, but the captain said that uh, we'll wait till morning. And the reason for that is because uh, uh, it was the early morning that uh, any ship coming in uh, with troops or not, they would have the uh, tugboats with their fire hoses and make a big uh, splash of the coming back. And of course, at that period of time, the commuters were on their ferry, uh, the ferry boats uh, crossing over from New Jersey. And so there would be a big uh, uh, welcome so we waited till morning and arrived back in uh, uh, New York early, about 9 o'clock in the morning. Well, you deserve the honor of the greeting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, now, did you return to, to the Brooklyn Army Base? Well, after we uh, arrived there, I, uh, uh, I checked back to find out what we were supposed to do. <clears throat> and we were told to report back to... Uh, our original uh, uh, base uh, mm -hmm. at uh, Brooklyn Army Base, which we did. And uh, we got off, and that was the first time I ever saw the captain uh, who was in charge of the company I was with. Mm -hmm. And so we just walked in, we said we got off the ship and would like to leave. And he'd say, well, okay, there were three of us. He said, uh, you gave us a 10-day furlough. And I took off and went to uh, back to New Jersey and uh, visited a few friends too. Mm -hmm. But coming back, I reported back to the uh, uh, Brooklyn Army base to uh, where our headquarters were, only to find out that they had moved. <laughs> so I didn't know where I was supposed to go. And finally, you went around the base till I found where the uh, MP uh, uh, headquarters were and tried to find out where we where I, Bill it was, and uh, so they fella took me over and we reported back. So this is where I finally found out. Right. All your personal gear was gone too. Oh yeah, everything was gone. I finally finally located it because they put it in the warehouse. <laughs> yeah. Now, what were your new duties here at uh, Brooklyn? Well, when I got back, we got back. Uh, I don't recall just what happened to my other two fellas. Uh, whether where they got assigned, but I got assigned to uh, work out of the uh, uh, Brooklyn Army Base uh, as uh, inspector for uh, incoming uh, uh, Army transports or transports that were going out to uh, check to make sure that the uh, SO radar that they had was uh, in uh, uh, good operating condition. Mm -hmm. Now this this was a rather small group you were with now, right? Well, there were just two of us that got assigned. <laughs> I was assigned to a, uh, uh, a second lieutenant, and uh, he had an apartment uh, in Brooklyn, and uh, so sometimes I would go over to his apartment and spend the night there, or uh, else I would uh, just uh, uh, get on a ferry, go over to New Jersey, where, where my folks lived in Clifton, New Jersey, and then... Uh, uh, Maybe about two or three times a week, I would report to the headquarters, mm -hmm. walk in to find out what was going on, and uh, uh, nothing. So we would took off. So we always felt like uh, <laughs> we weren't part of the army. We just <laughs> would get assignment, and he would get the assignments of what ships were in, right. and we would take care of it. Someday we would have uh, three or four ships that we'd have to inspect, and then there are other days there weren't any, and if there weren't any uh, ships that were in, well, we had the day off. Had the time off, yeah. as needed. Yeah. Uh, did you stay at Brooklyn the rest of your time in the Army? I stayed there the rest of the time until this one day that uh, I did walk in, and the fellow said, uh, you're going to uh, Fort Dix for discharge uh, Sunday morning. And uh, uh, well, that was good. We got, got prepared. But by the same token, we found out that uh, the... Uh, uh, captain who was in charge 
uh, wanted to declare us all essential because of the fact that uh, he was short on personnel to uh, take care of all the jobs that were required. So he said he was going down to Washington to see if he can get the order uh, canceled. Well, s uh, Sunday morning, we went down, got on a bus, and we headed down towards uh, Fort Dix. Uh, and uh, I did get discharged that week. We went through the discharge uh, uh, process. It, it wasn't until uh, maybe about a month after that, uh, uh, we, uh, John, the other fellow that was uh, from Long Island, w we got together in New York uh, to just get together, if you will, and we happened to run into some of the fellows that were uh, still in the Army, mm -hmm. and they told us that uh, uh, we were lucky in that uh, the captain did get the, the order canceled, but that anyone that was in transit to a discharge center, they would not make them come back. Okay. But anybody that was getting ready to go, and we're not on a bus, it was canceled. Do you remember your date of discharge? Oh, let's see. No. I May, I believe it was of uh, uh, 46. Yes, that's. Now, after your discharge, did you return to Clifton, New Jersey? Yeah, I returned to Clifton in uh, Join the 5220 Club, which I'm sure that everyone is familiar with. Right. You want to explain it? <laughs> that was for uh, any Army veteran would get $20 a week for 52 weeks after he got discharged. And I was a member of that uh, organization, I think, for a couple of months. Just took life easy and, uh, and just, did just didn't do anything really exciting. Now, you finally got a job. You wanted to, and no, well, finally, I decided it's time to go to work because I uh, uh, just can't uh, sit on and take life easy. You just, life moves on. As I say, it was just another phase, and I had to look forward to what's going on. So I did get a job uh, working for Alan B. Dumont during that period of time when uh, uh, television was uh, uh, coming into uh, life. And uh, I got a job working as a uh, project engineer with them. And uh, I was with them for uh, a little under a year until uh, uh, 47 when uh, I decided that uh, I wasn't getting anywhere. And uh, my uncle had the opportunity, if you wish, to uh, uh, go to college for veterans. So I took advantage of that. The GI Bill? The GI Bill, that is right. And uh, so I uh, went back to college, work on a master's degree. Where did you go, George? And I went to George? Uh, Georgia Tech down at Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And uh, there I worked for, it was about a year, year, about a year and a half. They took me to get my uh, master's degree. Mm -hmm. And upon graduation, uh, well, prior to graduation, uh, this is a period of time when uh, they were looking for engineers, and so companies would uh, send their representatives to the different colleges and interview uh, seniors or graduate students who were getting out uh, for employment. Mm -hmm. And uh, during this period of time, uh, I did go for a number of interviews, and I had um, offers from uh, a few com companies, Westinghouse, uh, there was an oil company down in uh, Texas, uh, uh, Baldwin Locomotives down in Philadelphia, and also one for GE. And so I ex took the one for uh, GE, and uh, uh, when I had finished, I, uh, I was off and running, and uh, that's how I ended up coming here to Pittsfield, Massachusetts. And that for, was when? That was, uh, uh, or, or, well, I guess it was the... Uh, uh, latter part of 1948 I see. is uh, when I came to work for GE. And uh, how long did you work at uh, GE, George? Um, you know, I think it was approximately about 32 years plus. Mm -hmm. well, what year did and, you retire? Uh, I retired in 1983. I see. Uh, did you marry and have children? Uh, yes, it was um, in June of 24th. 1950 is when I got married, 
Uh, it was the day that the Korean War started. That's why I remember that date. So uh, I should remember more for my anniversary, but uh, <laughs> that was the other incident that happened that day. And how'd you meet your wife? Uh, she was a secretary at uh, GE, and uh, we started, uh, I started flirting with her, and uh, one thing <laughs> led to another, and uh, we're happily married. Yes. <laughs> we have uh, uh, two boys. Uh, Rich, who is the uh, fire chief here in Dalton, Massachusetts, and uh, Brian, who uh, is the owner of uh, Country Corners, which is a uh, uh, liquor and uh, variety store. And I have one grandson, Joshua, uh, who uh, is at the present time attending uh, Berkshire Community College. Oh, very nice. Uh, did you join any veterans organizations, George? Uh, yes, I uh, joined the uh, uh, American Legion, and I've been a member of it for a little over 40 years now. Oh, we're winding down now, George, uh, and probably have one last question here, and it's, do you feel that your time in the service had a positive or a negative effect on I the rest of your I always looked at it as being a positive effect, and the reason for that is because when I was in the service, I met a lot of people. Uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, fun together, if you want to look at it. You know, we're just uh, being friendly with people. That's the important thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, to me, it was a phase of life. I learned a lot uh, that, uh, as time went on, helped me. And uh, I never regretted it. The only thing I regretted about it, what had happened to every one of us, is the fact that it took a few years out of our life of things that we would have preferred to do. I know I would have preferred to do other things than spend the time in the Army, but that it was a time when that was uh, what had to be done. And uh, so it was just another phase. And then getting into uh, uh, working uh, into, uh, with GE, moving into Pittsfield, Massachusetts, it was another phase of life. Uh, what happened in the past, I can look back on, but you can't go back. You right. always have to move forward. So to me, it was uh, just another step forward, mm -hmm. and that's what I did. Well, thank you. And George, I want to thank you for coming here this morning and sharing your story with us, and I also want to thank you for your service to our country. Well, I appreciate your asking me. Thank you, me. George. Thank you very much, Dick.